you, brothers and sisters. We're always thankful to the Lord when you can come to His house and be able to worship, because this is obviously a privilege. It's a wonderful thing to be able to be known of the Lord, and it's our desire to give Him the honor that is due to Him whenever we can. And this is one of the wonderful ways that we're able to do it, because by doing this, not only do we honor our God, but we ourselves receive a blessing, right? Because the church is being built up. And who is the church? We are the church. So we're very thankful for that. I want you to keep in mind this week as you go on to keep in prayer the congregation and the families of the congregation. We have many people who are not here because they're sick. Some people did have a, a did fall to the pandemic. And uh, so we want to pray to the Lord that he may be able to protect and be able to get the people through that. Because we know that we have an example from Second Chronicles when the temple was created in the Old Testament, that the Lord himself said that people were supposed to look to him there when the plagues and the disasters come. So when these things come, we have to come to our Lord, and we need to pray for those that are dealing with these things, and most of all, be thankful to the Lord, because there's been very few deaths that we've been hearing, at least within our circles, and that's a great grace that we give to our God. I also want to, uh, not to put him on the spot, but I want to thank uh, Brother Keldon for the great work he's doing with visuals, because I sometimes make mistakes on my notes, and he helped me to correct them. So thank you, Brother. I appreciate that. Amen. Let us go ahead and begin with prayer. Blessed Lord, I ask you, Father, to be able to meet us at this place, that you would indeed always provide your spirit, that you would stir us up, that we would be aided, Lord, in being able to indeed love our God first and foremost, and that in that same way we would be able to show wonderful love and grace also to our neighbor, Lord. Indeed, you are the God of love, and we will know only true love in you, Father. We live in a world that is corrupt, and even though everyone understands, Lord, the significance of love, they do not necessarily practice it right, Lord. But in you, who is the perfect one, we can be made clean, Lord, and we can have an understanding of this. And I pray that today, Father, as we get into Romans, you will continue to Speak to us regarding this wonderful message of the gospel and how man has a responsibility to move forward. For we ask that in your precious and holy name, amen. amen. So reading from Romans 2, so we're starting out chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, publicly read 1 through 11. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, Every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. Now, when we do preaching, it's not just explaining the verses. It's very important that we understand the context of the book and what we're reading. And in the first chapter, obviously we spoke about the power of the gospel, the essence of the gospel, and how it has an impact on everything. Jesus Christ impacts everything because everything is not only to Him, but for Him. So, in light of knowing that, one of the things that we learn in Romans 1 is how even without necessarily a special revelation, God has made us in such a way that we, because we are made in His image, we are to know what is what is good. Because if even the creation itself speaks to His glory. 
But what we are told is the nature of man. That man, because of the darkened heart of man, he is reduced to basically his own darkness, into his own vain thinking, into his own ideas. And as our brother, uh, Pastor Gerard, has been preaching, ultimately, basically getting to the worst of sins, which is sexual immorality. And the reason that that happens is because the, the, the uh, Apostle Paul, excuse me, in the book of Corinthians tells us that all sins are not against the body except for sexual immorality. That is the one that actually works against the body. And so that's how we see how man gets so debased that he even leads himself to the point of debasing his own body. And our bodies, what are they supposed to be? They're supposed to be the temple of the Lord. If we are a people of God, that's what our bodies are. That's why we are to abstain from, from those things. And when it's speaking of these things, it's speaking of all humanity. So what is all humanity? It's the nations. Right? So it's speaking this in particular about the Gentiles. So when we get to chapter 2, now we're getting into the issue of a Jewish context. Now why do I mention this? Because when we look at the calling of Abraham, what is God doing there? He's getting very particular now about how his salvation and his message is coming through. So the Jews understood that they had a special situation. They, why? Because they were the people of God. They were the ones who got the oracles, as uh, Paul speaks it later on in Romans 9 and 10. They're the ones who receive the covenants. They're the ones who receive all this great blessing. The Gentiles don't have this. So because the Gentiles don't have this, they feel special, right? Because they feel, oh, we are sons of Abraham. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I found very interesting is that in today's psalm, in Psalm 59, it actually spoke of, of you know, the enemies, and the enemies were usually the Gentiles, and it actually speaks about them as dogs. And it's kind of interesting because if you look at the, uh, at the Jewish context in the time of Jesus, that's how they were referred to the Gentiles. They were referred to them as dogs. And when I was a kid, I, also, I, I used to remember thinking, why, why did they refer to them as dogs? Well, for probably scriptural purposes. Because it's not only in that particular psalm, but in other areas where the Gentiles... Are referred that way. But I also want to point out that in the uh, previous uh, sermon that our, our brother preached, he very much dealt with the issue of total depravity, which has to do with the nature of man and the fact that man is not righteous. He is incapable of being saved in and of himself because he cannot do good, because he is evil. And there was a great illustration that was given by our brother from that uh, famous cartoon called Rick and Ralph, which I have not had the pleasure of seeing. But in there, you know, there was that uh, uh, bad guy uh, affirmation, and he mentioned about how it was very enlightening to see that, you know, basically in, in this affirmation, it's basically stating, oh, this is what, what we are, and this is what we need to come to acceptance, right? In other words, there has to be that recognition that we are sinners, and that we need a savior. We need to be redeemed, we need to be changed. The only difference is that the bad part about that affirmation is at the very end, where they basically say, there's nothing better that I would like to be than, than who I am. And that's actually where the difference comes. Because we should not have a desire to be who we want, or what we are. Our desire is to be as God wants us to be. And that's why Christ came. Christ came to be the image bearer that we are supposed to be after. We are, both men and women are supposed to follow in the precepts of Christ. And that's what we have in Scripture. So when we look at uh, verse 1, when it says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on, on another you can live yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Now what's, what it's making the point here is, you have the Jews saying, Oh, well, we're better than the Gentiles, because we don't do those depraved things that they do. We're a clean people. But what he's actually showing here is, No, you're not. Because we just laid out all the various sins that came, came about because of the abandonment of, of God. And yet you, who are supposed to be the people of God, are actually doing the same thing. And yet you go and judge, you know, the Gentiles. You're judging others. So he's saying, basically, woe to you. Why? Because God is a judge. Before the gospel, what did we have? We were given the law of God. And in the law of God, we understand his statutes. We understand his standard. But the problem is that the Jews have deceived themselves into thinking, oh, here we have a standard by which we can walk in. When in reality, what you were supposed to do is look at that standard and realize, wait a minute, I cannot keep this standard. 
I cannot be as God desires me to be. If you cannot be as God desires you to be, what is going to be your faith, brothers and sisters? Condemnation. And the interesting thing here is that it is actually condemning those who are judging. And this is an important uh, issue because of the fact that this actually takes us to what is being uh, discussed in Matthew 7. And I'd like to read Matthew 7, 1 through 5, which states, this is a famous passage, and uh, I like uh, when I have to deal with this because it's a good time to make clarification because there's a, a lot of ignorance about this within the church. It states, Judge not that you not be judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now I want you to notice something. People are very quick to quote them, right? Judge not just, you know, lest you be judged. Now, yes, it's a good admonition if you are playing the hypocrite. But the fact of the matter is that God does call us to judge. In John 7, it actually speaks that we are to make a righteous judgment. So what it's actually dealing with here is to not be a hypocrite. This is what basically verse 1 is dealing with. He's telling the Jews, you need to not be a hypocrite. Now brothers and sisters, this was a sin of the Jews, but this can happen in the church today. This is a, a, a sin that can still happen in the church today. We have to be very careful with how we judge things. Because it's also related to our walk. If you notice, I really like the ending of the verse because it says, First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck out of your brother's eye. Now I want you to notice that Jesus said this. So that means that we are not only to make judgments, but that we are to work on ourselves. We are to avoid being hypocrites. So that if we see a sin in someone else, we need to first examine ourselves. We need to make sure that we are not in the same course as that person is. Because if not, we disqualify ourselves from being able to make that kind of judgment. But what does God want? God wants us to repent. He wants us to walk rightly so that we can make that judgment. Because when we're making judgments, brothers and sisters, we're determining between what is good and what is bad. Right? And when we look at all things, that's what we have to look at. So returning to the uh, illustration that we had regarding the uh, bad guy affirmation, the thing at the very end that makes it bad is the fact that they're basically being at peace with who they are, and that's what we cannot do. That's why we need to be examining ourselves so that we can make righteous judgments because God has called us to judge the world. And there's different ways, of course, in which we mean that. We don't mean in terms of condemning the world because that's actually for God to do, right? And we know that we have texts where it speaks of that that even the, that the angels don't even rebuke, but they say the Lord rebuke you because that is left for God to do. But we are to encourage and we are to call out our brothers if they are in sin. To what end? Not to condemn them, but that they may repent and that they may be saved and that they may walk a righteous path. Continuing forward, if we look at verses now uh, 2 and 3, it says, We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things, and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Right? So here, what this is now dealing with is the fact that because God is a righteous judge, that doesn't mean that anybody's going to get it back. Nobody gets a pass. So if you are in a sin, if you are in practicing a sin, and you are unrepentant of the sin, even though you may have faith in who Jesus is, you may have faith in the Word of God, you may believe in Yahweh as God, that's not going to save you, brothers. Because repentance is very key to the Gospel. So it's very, very important that we understand that. And we have a great example of this point in 2 Peter 2, verses 3-4, to which states... And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell, and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Now, this is a great example, because this is actually showing us that God means business. And the angels who were in heaven, who left their place, and committed sin, what did God do to them? He put them in chains, awaiting judgment. 
The same thing can happen to us, but the angels are in greater position right now than we are as men. And they're not spared. If God is not sparing the angels. He's not going to spare us either. Continuing, let us look now at Matthew 5, verses 25 and 26. It says, Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going to going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid, paid the last penny. So this is the point. God takes sin seriously. And every sin is going to be judged. So we have to be very diligent, brothers and sisters, to examine ourselves and to be at peace with God. And we have to be walking rightly. It's not enough that we uh, have received grace and mercy in the sense that that is the terms of salvation, but God still requires us to walk in the light. We are children of the light. Are we children of darkness? No. And that's what we are supposed to be encouraging that we be able to walk in the holiness of God so that we may be not only spared of judgment in, 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 this, in this age, right? Because we still, we do have, also have a consequence for our sin, but that we also uh, walk uh, consistently with the, uh, with the message of God, particularly because we are called to some of God. Uh, continuing forward, I want to look now at verse 4. Verse 4 states, or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So in other words, here what it's making the point is that the goodness of God is not there to be cheaply used. God is actually using it as a mercy. The fact that God has not come and already judged the world is a mercy in and of itself. I mean, if you think about the thousands of years that have gone by, I mean, how much evil has happened? And this is something that has, you know, happens in the face of God, right? For all, for all these years. And uh, we see the, the great mercy of God because even particularly on those, there are people that are very blasphemous to the Lord and to the name of the Lord. And, they, and in many ways, we see them live and prosper, right? But there's a reason why God, God is doing that. But a lot of that has to do actually with the church itself, with those of us, that He's giving us patience. He's being patient towards us. We know that uh, we have what's called common grace, which is that the sun comes up on not only the, uh, the righteous, but also on the wicked, right? But all that goodness that God is also doing for man, they're going to have to be uh, taken into account as well. So we have to also speak of those things to those people. That's why we have to be at peace with God. We have to have a connection with God, because that's how we have forgiveness. That's how we can receive the wonderful uh, salvation and gifts that He gives unto us. I'd like to take a look at 2 Peter 3, which says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all, oh, excuse me, but that all should reach repentance. Now, it's, this is an important text because there are those who actually use this as a statement to say that God wants every single person out there, you know, to be repentant in terms of that He's expecting, you know, His grace is upon everyone the same way. No, this is actually being written to a particular people, right? To a church. And if you notice, that's why it uses the, the pronoun you. You. Who was He speaking to? He was speaking to the church. So this, this uh, slowness that God has is a slowness that is actually for us. So we have to be very thankful to God that He's greatly merciful. And that in the fact that He's merciful to us, He's also being merciful to others, right? Because we know that as time goes, the kingdom of God is growing, and that the grace of God is actually reaching a number of people. But one day, that's going to come to an end. When God has His uh, number, we know that that's going to come to an end. And the, and the condemnation of God will be, will be enacted forward. I'd like to also look at Hebrews 10. Verses 29, or I guess it's just verse 29. It says, How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? Now, 
we were dealing with the fact that in, in verse 4, it actually speaks about basically taking advantage of the, the kindness and the forbearance of God. And uh, I like the Hebrews 10 passage because this is the passage that actually speaks of those people who had accepted Christ back in, in the first century and then abandoned, abandoned Christ. They went back to the Old Testament. They went back to Judaism, to, to the old uh, dispensation, if I may use that word. And right here it states it very clearly that these people, there's no forgiveness there. Because what are they doing? They're trampling underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, in the same way, brothers and sisters, we have to be diligent in our walk with the Lord. We want to make sure that we are connected with the Lord, that we don't take for granted His goodness, and that we walk away sloppily because of the fact that we want to do what we desire. We have to remember that if we are children of God, if God is our Father, then we are to be obedient to God. And that we want to have the ability to be able to be blessed by our God and ultimately to receive our salvation. But that cannot be done if you're walking away from the faith. We know that there's a situation of a backsliding, and that's something that does occur with a Christian, right? Why? Because our own inadequacies. And I actually understand too that God uses that, obviously, uh, to our end, because if God is disciplining us, sometimes it's His moving away that allows us to understand what this world is like. I know that for a fact because I grew up in a Christian home. I was given the gospel at six years old. Of course, I understood it to the magnitude that I could when I was six years old. But I greatly loved God and uh, did have a witness of God. But as I went into my teen years, it started getting difficult for different reasons. One is because obviously your heart persuades you to other things and you want to look at experience life in, in different areas and you begin to question the very religion that you're practicing. A big, part, a big problem for me was that the... Uh, church that I grew up with could not answer many of the things that I was kind of dealing with. And, but I know that the Lord led me to go, go astray, to go out of my way so that I would understand what it actually was not to be in the church and what, what is the grace and the truth to be in God. And having come out of that, it, it's actually been a benefit for me because I, I could tell you as one who, who lived as a, a, in a Christian home, who lived under, under a the guidance of, of the church, you know, what, what that is compared to not not being under it. Why? Because by not following the faith for some years, I was able to see the futility of my own desires and my own thinking and how eventually it led to my own corruption. Many of the things that I thought I, I had a handle, I did not have a handle. The Lord, as, as the scripture says, a little, uh, a little leaven uh, leavens the whole lump, right? That's basically what happens. You know, you... You begin with a few sins, right? You think, okay, well, it's not this thing to deal with. And before you know it, you know, you have a whole life of sin. You're out of whack. You know, and it takes the Lord. We have to remember the Lord and return to His grace. Because that's when, we're, when, when we can have perspective. That's when we can have hope. Do I sin now? Yes, I sin now. But repentance is something that is much easier for me to do now. Why? Because I have the guiding hand of God. I have God working within my heart. And I have His Word which of course uh, gives me that light to do, which I encourage you highly to, to seek, so that you may be able to work on your own sanctification. Now continuing in verses uh, 5 and 6, we read, Because of your heart and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. Now here... It's obviously restating the fact that God is going to judge. He's going to judge every single thing that we do. But why is He going to judge us? Because the sin that we have has to do with our nature. The things that we get into, the things that we desire, those are the things that get us into trouble. Now we live in a world today that's uh, kind of telling us things that are very different. We're being told that you know if we're... Uh, if we fall into certain groups, you know, that we're victims and that, you know, the reason we are the way that we are is because of the fact that, you know, someone else manipulated or took advantage of us. Now, mind you, that might not necessarily not be true, but does that justify for you to do evil or to justify your evil or for your sin? No. The scripture teaches us not to repay evil with evil. So we are commanded by God to do what is good. 
And obviously, how do we know this? By the very things that we're looking at now, by looking at the Word of God. We have a great example in the, uh, in the parable of uh, the rich man and Lazarus, because the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, you know, the, uh, the, the rich man basically tells Abraham, can you send, you know, uh, Lazarus to go speak to my family so that they would believe that they could be spared, right, from the condemnation to come. And his answer wasn't, uh, oh, sure, you know, we'll, we'll send them out or we'll have God do it. No, he actually says for that they have Moses and the prophets. And when it spoke of Moses and the prophets in the Old Testament, that was understood as being the Old Testament text, you know, the Bible. So God has provided answers. If the world is not seeking brothers and sisters, is that God's fault? Has not God given his churches? Getting back, getting back to the whole point, you know, it's one of the things that I found interesting is I was having a conversation with Dad, and we're talking about how it seems like no matter where you go in the world, there's Jews there. You know, it could be Alaska, it could be Africa, it could be China. You know, they, when they, they've actually come back from uh, all four, four quarters of the earth, as, as the scripture says. But it's kind of interesting because in that same way, Christianity itself has spread around the world. Right? Because what is the church? The church is everyone who is under Christ. Now, is that only, is that only the Jews? That's everyone. So we know that the, the message of God has gone, through, is going, not only has gone, but is going throughout the world. So people will know of the word of God. But the question is, what are they doing with it? And that's where we get to tell that message, where we get to explain the significance of that, right? It's not enough that God gave his word, but that you know, he has his people, that we are supposed to be his ambassadors, right? That's, that's what we're told, that we're ambassadors, why? Because we represent the kingdom of God. And so it's, it's very, very important to keep that in mind, you know, when we consider these things. Now, I'd like to go ahead and go to Acts 7.51 to show how this truth about the uh, inadequacy of man can be seen even within, within again, the Jews. So in, in Acts uh, 7, uh, 51 it says, You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Now this is quite a statement. Because this is Stephen rebuking the, uh, the, the Jews at, uh, I think at the Sahib, you know. And so when he's doing this, he's, you know, this, this obviously got them very indignant because they obviously were very zealous, as we learned with Paul, to keep the, the faith of their fathers. But the interesting thing is that he not only rebukes them, for being stiff-necked, right? And having bad heart, but he actually mentions their fathers. <laughs> so, so it's telling me that there's no Jews, right? Not even the Jews, not even their forefathers were any good, right? So, so that's something that we have to uh, keep in mind. You know, that we don't, we, we want to be in, we want to be with the Lord. We, we need His forgiveness because if we are not, if we are not in the Lord, you know, those things will be, uh, we will be held accountable, accountable for those things. In uh, 1 Peter 1, 17, we read, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. Right here it says exile, in other translations it says oh, in your sojourning. And the reason it mentions this, brothers and sisters, is because our life is, 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 is in exile. We are in exile because where is our home? Where is our true home? It's in heaven. Right? It's just like the... Uh, the Jewish fathers, Abraham, Isaac, you know, Jacob, they spoke of their lives as being a sojourning. I remember in, uh, in the book of Hebrews, it's, it, when it speaks about, about the, the sojourning, I always thought, you know, that, that it speaks about Abraham not, you know, seeing the land as his home, but, but, but considered that uh, he was waiting for the city that was made not by human hands. And I always, I always thought to myself, wow, how, how do you get a Jew to understand that? Right? Because when Abraham was given the promise, he was told, look to your left, look to your right, you know, north, south, all this is going to be, a, you know, your, your inheritance. Right? So we look at, at a physical place that, that, was, that was being given. But we see here that there was a greater understanding, a greater understanding that they had. And that's why when Jacob appeared before the Pharaoh, he described not only his life, but the life of Isaac and Abraham as being his journey. Because that's what we're doing, brothers and sisters. We're just passing through. We have to remember that we're citizens of heaven. And so the will 
of God is what we want to put forth here. That's what we're seeking here. We're looking for the redemption of this world. Why are we looking to Jesus? Why are we looking to him coming back? He already paid the price at the cross, right? But the fact that he's coming back is because he's going to change it. This world is not going to be that land that's right now, you know, so many miles out in the Middle East. It's going to be something far greater, and that's what we await. Turning now to verse 7, it says, Judge not, excuse me, I'm reading the wrong one. It says, uh, those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Now here we're getting the positive. We've been talking a lot about obviously being sinners and escaping the wrath and the condemnation that, that is coming, which of course if you are in Jesus Christ, you are not condemned. But we're now going to be learning about the benefits. The benefits of being saved, of, being, of, of waiting on God. And the wonderful things that we are to receive. A great example of this is in Psalm 37, verses 7 through 9. It states, Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for Him. Friend not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain, refrain from anger, and forsake wrath. Friend not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall what? Inherit the land. And this is in reference to the land that is to come. That's what it's speaking of. But I want you to notice, how are we able to do this? How are we able to be patient? By not falling into sin. Even when great evils are being done to us, or when we see uh, the, great, uh, the, the great manipulators and those who are, who are taking advantage of the people, Many times, of course, we, like Habakkuk, right, we, we, we are indignant over it because we feel, how is it that a good God allows for such great evil to happen? But we know that God has His purposes and that everything that He's doing, He's doing it for His own good purpose. And so for here, we're, we're speaking about, when it says not fretting, it means not being disturbed by it, not being given over to anger. So when you are in an issue where... Someone's putting you in a in a uh, in a state of temptation, particularly in in, in a, it may be an offense or, or a point of anger. Refrain from it, brothers and sisters, so that you don't fall into sin. When we go through these trials, we are actually supposed to be learning, and we're in essence toughening up. That's what God is doing. When we have these different trials and we get through them, we're supposed to be toughening up. The Bible says that he who doesn't learn is what a fool. And if you're a child of God, you're not supposed to be a fool brother. We have to be men and women of wisdom. And so the things that are happening in your life, they're happening for a purpose. So examine, examine what God is trying to show you. Because it, it can make you stronger and actually build your sanctification. Because what is, what is sanctification? It's building upon our holiness, right? What are we doing? We're repenting, working more and more to be like our beloved Savior. Jesus Christ. By uh, turning now to verse uh, verses eight and nine, it says, "But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek." I really like uh, the way it puts it here because. It's a reiteration again that God is saying the wicked may be looking like they're prospering. Great evils are coming upon you, perhaps unjustly, right? Maybe you didn't do anything wrong and yet bad things are happening to you. But don't worry about it. Because it's not going to go unpunished. God will be punishing that sin. He will be punishing that sin. And that's why it speaks of a tribulation will come to them. So the great comfort that we have, brothers and sisters, is that, as Paul has said, for the little, the little of sufferings that we have here, we have a great glory, a great glory and great reward awaiting. So don't allow yourselves to be uh, provoked into anger and lose such a great blessing. Because that's what we desire, brothers and sisters. It's not only to be able to be forgiven of our sins, but to have a life in God. 
Right? That's the wonderful. The wonderful thing about being a Christian is not only that you're being spared from hell, but it's just, is that you have a relationship with God. Right? God is working with you. You're knowing you. I like what uh, verse uh, 5 and 6 of Proverbs 3 tells us. It states, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your paths. Now this is an important passage, and I don't know if you, if you uh, brothers and sisters have thought about it, but you know, a lot of times, I remember as a kid reading this, but I want you to ask yourselves, do you really put everything everything into the Lord's hands? Do you really, really put everything into the Lord's hands? You know, one of the, uh, one of the things that I thought was, was very touching to me, and I thought it was really, really good prayer, was uh, Sister Christina, who is not able to be, be here with us, uh, prayed that the Lord would actually give obedience to the children. That God would give you know, children that would be obedient, that they would have the ability to be obedient. And I thought, that's such a smart prayer. Do we pray about that? Do we pray about those things? I know that you know we, when we lose our jobs, we're very quick, right? To ask the Lord to give us a job, right? To want to raise, right? To get sick. But how often do we pray for the neighbors that we know? We're having the ability to be able to communicate the gospel. Or there's so many things, if you really think about it, that we can really take advantage to really put under the Lord, and the Lord can really set a, a straight path for us. So I, I'd like you to really think on that, because I've certainly learned that. There's certainly things that I've put into prayer. I remember when I was a little boy, I used to pray. I, I didn't understand what it was, but you know, I used to hear about wisdom, and I'm like, I have no idea what that is. I thought it just meant to be knowledgeable, but wisdom is something quite different. And I, but I used to pray. And I was a kid, I said, Lord... I don't know what wisdom is, but whatever it is, give it to me. You know? <laughs> now, how much of that wisdom do I use all the time? Well, that's a different story, right? <laughs> but, uh, but the Lord has definitely, uh, uh, obviously, light, given me a light to my path, and many wonderful blessings have come because He has provided wisdom. And, and I pray that the Lord would do the same for you guys, and that you guys would do the same, that you would ask the Lord for such things. Psalm 37, verse 38 states, but transgressors shall be altogether destroyed. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. Once again, there's no hope for the wicked. But what I like is that in this verse, it states to the Jew and to the Greek also. And the reason why that's important is because what God is showing is that he's not impartial. That he's not going to, just because you think you're a Christian, or because the Jew thought he was a Jew, he's not going to give you less of a pass. It's the same way he's going to be judging the Greek, Right? He's going to be judging also the, uh, the Jew, you know, the, the believer. So we definitely want to be able to pursue the Lord with, with a conscience that is clean so that we may be able to not only uh, obey God, right, but also to bring pleasure to our Lord. Because we're supposed to be having a relationship with God. And He is diligent and He will be judging all. And as it states here, you know, all of the of the of the transgressors are going to be destroyed together. So we know that if uh, God is faithful, you know, to us in in His goodness, He's going to be faithful also to destroy wickedness, because He's a, a righteous judge. Looking at the last verses, which are ten and eleven, it says, "But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good." Once again, the Jew first, and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. And so here, you know, he's, he's really driving in the point that God is not only the God of the Jews. He's the God of the earth. He's the God of all people. And that the way he is going to judge the wicked, he's also going to bring honor and peace to those of us who come to him. That's the wonderful thing. In a, one of the texts, actually, that we looked at in the Sunday school today, when he was in John, it actually speaks of Jesus being the shepherd. And he speaks of another sheep. And that other sheep has to do with the Gentiles. Because in the context, who did he go to when Jesus came? He came to the house of Israel. Right? But he was speaking of the Gentiles that were also coming in. But the wonderful thing is that he says that he's going to make one flock. So for those of you who believe that there's a distinction between the church and Israel, sorry about that. That's, that, that's clearly not thought in scripture. You know, if he's making one group of people. You know, we're, we're joining, we're being grafted in. 
right? As the book of Romans tells us. So that's the wonderful thing, that the same God who's going to judge all will also honor and bring peace to all. And I'd like to take a look at uh, Proverbs 21, 21, which states, whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life, righteousness, and honor. So we see again the faithfulness of God and the good fruit that it brings. Philippians 4 tells us, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So this is a wonderful text that explains to us how to receive that peace. We have to be thankful. We have to be thankful to God. Because it's His goodness that, that is continuing before us. And as we learn, if we are a people that are depraved, in the sense that we are sinful people, and utterly sinful people, we need to be thankful to the Lord for every good thing that we receive. Because even in the bad things, the Lord brings good from them. And we know that we have examples of that, such as in the life of Joseph, right? Or even in the life of Daniel, right? So, we have great examples in Scripture of how consider all things good in light of what the Lord is doing. And being thankful for every situation because He's bringing about His good. Finally, in making this particular point regarding the fact that God is not only the God of the Jews, we have the famous passage from John 3.16, which states, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. Right? So who is this being offered to? Being offered to the world. Right? In context, he's speaking to Nicodemus. Right? And once again, Nicodemus was a Jew. But he's making the point that he's not only, he's not only coming for the Jews, He's coming for the for the whole world. Matter of fact, I'll I'll I'd like to let you guys know that that's actually one of the evidences for the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Because when you look at the uh, time of Christ, there were many messiahs. There have been different messiahs, but at that time, all the messiahs were trying to fulfill what the Jewish people thought was 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 supposed to happen, which was to basically destroy the Gentiles and to lift up the, the nation of Israel. Is that what Jesus did? Did Jesus come to destroy the Gentiles and lift up the Jewish people? No. He actually, that's, that's one of the reasons why he's actually rejected by the Jews. Because what did he come and do? He came instead to die for sin. And not only the sins of Israel, right? But the sins of everyone, of all people, right? And he's calling who? He's calling all people. His people are from all over. Because the salvation of God, even as it states in the Old Testament, and the Jew knows this, was supposed to go all over the world. It wasn't just in Israel, it was supposed to go all over the world. And that is a sign that Jesus Christ indeed is who he claimed to be. The two uh, applications that I'd like to give are observations that I, uh, that I, that I see from the text, but that are also related to... Uh, Situations that I kind of see in a society. And the number one is your affiliation with your religion won't save. And the reason I say this is because, uh, particularly I know in the 20th century, there was this uh, particular big idea that if you were part of a certain church, or if you were baptized, okay, that meant that you were saved. And so, you know, so you meet people that were, you know, Presbyterian, Anglican. Methodist, and they said, oh, I was baptized in my church. And I said, oh, how do you say, oh, I was baptized in this church? That's not the basis of brothers and sisters. That's not the basis of your salvation. Your salvation is your repentance unto your God, not your religion. That is supposed to be the basis of your religion. But a lot of times what people do is they trust in their religion instead of trusting in the Lord himself. That's why the Lord rightly rebuked the Pharisees when he said, you guys swear by the altar, Instead of swearing by God who makes the altar holy. So we have to keep in mind that our relationship has to be directly with God. What we practice, such as here we're a Reformed Baptist Church. The reason we are a Reformed Baptist Church is because we believe that the scriptural convictions in the Reformed Baptist uh, a belief are being true to what the Word of God says. But it's not being a Reformed Baptist that's going to save you. 
It's the fact that you have a relationship with God, that you have repented through God, and that He, you're trusting in His works, and not your affiliation and what you are doing. For that, I'd like to go to Philippians 3, 3, which states, For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Notice that. The true circumcision, brothers and sisters, is what's done spiritually. It's not the practice of circumcision. Same thing with baptism. Right? It's not the going into the water that's going to save you and give you the connection with Christ. It's the Spirit. Right? The, what we're being bapti baptized into, as uh, John, uh, John the Baptist himself taught us, was that we would be receiving the baptism of fire. The baptism of Christ. That's, that spiritual reality is what truly says. The second uh, application that I want to make is, again, to reiterate the, uh, the point in the book of Romans, which is that this is not only about salvation to the Jews, but that it's a salvation to the world. And that's one of the things that Jesus, as the Messiah, is uh, it brought about, that, that was the great promise of the Old Testament. And in Acts 17, which is actually where Paul is addressing the... The, the people in Athens, he actually speaks of this in verses of 30 and 31. He says, The time of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance by all by raising him from the dead. Now notice the importance of the uh, resurrection here, brothers and sisters. That's the confirmation that we have. That we have a living Savior. That the promise of God is being fulfilled. Excuse me. <coughs> and so, we're, we're definitely to take consideration that nowadays, as we've said, the message has gone out, and God is not overlooking the ignorance. <coughs> Excuse me. In the time of, uh, of the time of the Jews, they were the only ones with whom God was speaking. They were the only ones who had the truth. They were the ones who received the covenants of the oracles. But not in the time of Christ. Because to whom is the new covenant given, brothers and sisters? It's given to all of us. So, the whole world stands condemned because of the fact that the message of Jesus Christ has gone into, out into the world and we are going to be held accountable by it. So that's why it's important that we hold on to the gospel, that we preach the gospel, and that we give the gospel because that is our salvation. That is a true salvation and that is the gift of God. Thank you, brothers. Let us pray. <coughs> Blessed Lord, we ask you, Father, to continue to work in our sanctification. Let our testimony be true. Let us examine ourselves that we may not be found to be hypocrites, yes. but that instead we would be repentant, always of the temptations and sins that befall us. I pray for everyone who's here, Father, that you may be able to bless them, give them your peace, Father, that they would receive honor and glory, that you would give us the ability to be patient, Father, patient, waiting the wonderful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, in which, indeed, everything will be redeemed, Lord, that that land that is spoken of in Scripture indeed will come, Lord, and that now, Father, you are making manifest your goodness upon all men, for even the wicked prosper at this time, Lord. For your common grace is also revealed from heaven, Lord. But we know that one day, Father, you will separate the sheep and the goats, and that indeed your holiness will be made manifest, and that we will know you as you are to be known, Father. So I ask you in the meantime to continue to work in our lives, and as we go out this week, Father, we may be able to be blessed by your presence and by the power of the wonderful gospel that you have given. We ask in your personal holy name. Amen.